I've been slacking off recently, taking on easy things to explain. I need a real challenge. And what better to talk about than a subject that most electrical engineers don't even touch until grad school. I'm talking about micro-electromechanical systems. One of the newest fields of engineering, MEMS is responsible for tuning ingots of silicon into all sorts of useful things like transistors, accelerometers, and internal combustion engines so small that they could fit on your thumb. Thankfully, it just so happens that I know a thing or two about MEMS. Today I would like to focus on sensors. Your phone has two or three. Your automobile has more than I could bother to count. Temperature, acceleration, pressure, force. So today I'm going to show you, step by step, how some of the most common MEM sensors are created so that anybody, even you, could make them. Nearly all microfabrication is done with silicon as the base material. Everything from transistors to force sensors. Silicon is so common, it's the second most abundant element here on planet Earth. But we can't use just any old silicon. In order to work with it effectively, we need to grow single crystal silicon. In order to make single crystal silicon for your sensor, all you need is a million dollar fully automated facility. I probably should have led with that. Assuming you have that, making single crystal silicon is so easy, they did it all the way back in the prehistoric times of the 1950s. The process is as follows. Start with a small piece of perfect silicon crystal made in a lab. This is called a seed crystal, which is dipped into molten silicon inside of a quartz crucible and slowly extruded upward while spinning to create a cylindrical column of perfect single crystal silicon. The columns of single crystal silicon are then cut into thin sheets called wafers to be sent out to over-eager engineers all over the world. But before they are, the manufacturers grind off a flat on the wafer so that the engineers know what orientation the crystal structure is in. This is incredibly important for any serious manufacturing. Crystal planes are simply repeating patterns of silicon atoms in the crystal structure and they each have different properties. Hey, let's talk about these two planes. Whereas most chemicals intuitively etch out in all directions, some chemical etchants, for example the very popular potassium hydroxide, etch 400 times faster parallel to these planes than perpendicular to them, allowing engineers to carve out near flawless pyramids into silicon. I would like to start using some terminology, and this is going to be important going forward. A mask. A mask is a stencil applied to do a process only in an area of our choosing. For instance, if I apply a mask over this video and then apply a red filter, when I remove the mask, the area that was visible in the mask is the only area that remains affected. Likewise, we can apply masks to materials to affect a change in only the area that we want. So if we make a mask like this out of a material that is resistant to the potassium hydroxide etch, then we can control how large our pyramid shape is, and by controlling how long we allow it to etch, we may stop it at any depth. Or, if we wanted the etch to stop by itself, we can bombard only this side of the silicon wafer with boron atoms to some precisely controlled depth into the material. By making that area of the crystal impure, the etch will stop once it reaches it. Diffusing boron into silicon is called doping, by the way, the same way that transistors are made. If we do our etch correctly and stop at the right point, we can be left with a very thin membrane of silicon. At this thickness, the silicon membrane acts all springy, like a trampoline. Its deflection depends on a lot of variables, but the takeaway is that applying a pressure will cause it to deflect by some constant amount. All that we need to do is somehow measure the movement of this membrane, and we can solve for what the pressure is causing that deflection. For this, we can go one of two routes. I'll show you both. To make a capacitive pressure sensor, we start by depositing two electrodes by using one of many vapor deposition techniques. We can deposit a metal conductor directly onto the membrane and deposit a similar metal conductor onto Pyrex glass. And then we need to bond the two things together. How do we do that? Uh, glue? 
Hmm, not sure I can swing that. How about instead we use a simple little process called anodic glass bonding. For this, we sandwich the glass and silicon together and heat the interface up to 400 degrees Celsius. Then we apply around 1000 volts of direct current across them with the positive charge on the silicon and the negative charge on the glass. This will result in the sodium atoms in the glass being pulled away from the interface, leaving behind oxygen atoms that will promptly bond to the silicon to form silicon dioxide, permanently bonding the two together. Interestingly, this bond at the interface is actually stronger than either the silicon or the glass on their own. Reviewing what we have done so far, there are now two metal plates of a capacitor inside a sealed chamber. If the pressure outside is greater than the pressure inside, the silicon membrane will bend and move the two plates closer together. The two plates form a device called a capacitor, which stores energy in an electric field between each plate. The energy storage gets exponentially larger as the two plates get closer together. Also, if these two plates touch somehow, there's enough energy stored between them that they'll weld together. So let's not forget to put a non-conducting dielectric over one of the plates, in insulation to prevent them from shorting out. To measure the pressure as an electric signal, the capacitor plates are paired with a coil to generate a resonating frequency depending on the capacitor field strength. If that sounds like just the worst, don't worry, there is a better way. Allow me to introduce you to the world of piezo resistors. This topic might be a little bit wild, but I'd be remiss not to talk about it since most pressure sensors use it nowadays. Let's back up a few steps before we made the capacitor plates, and instead deposit this funky material called a piezo resistor. These strips, sometimes made out of the following materials, change their resistance under stress. Hi, it's me, the editor. Despite the fact that our devoted team of researchers spend weeks crafting factually accurate videos, we may sometimes say things that aren't 100% factually correct such as the case with piezo resistors, which actually change the resistance based on strain, not stress. While the two are technically related, this technicality will cause countless viewers to send me angry emails urging me to delete my videos in disgrace. Well, joke's on you. Error corrected. And if you're wondering why I don't just re-record that scene... Good for you. By depositing these piezo resistors directly onto our flimsy membrane in a pattern called the Wheatstone configuration, we can get a very accurate idea of just how much the membrane is being deflected based on the very small change in voltage between these two points. See? Totally DIY. And your final product should look something like this. That was a great warm-up. Is my editor doing okay? Great! Well, let's get on to another sensor then. Next, let's make an accelerometer, which uses many of the same principles we've already covered with a little twist. Remember Newton's second law, force is equal to mass times acceleration? Well, if we know the force and the mass, then we should be able to figure out the acceleration. Hey, I know, remember Hooke's Law from high school physics? It says that the force on a spring is equal to the deflection of the spring times a number called the spring coefficient. So if we push down on a spring mass pair, which would actually look something a little more like this, and we know how much it moved, as well as the spring constant, then we can solve for the force. And then once we know the force and we know the mass, we can solve the acceleration. Easy peasy. As with the pressure sensor, we can use capacitance to measure the deflection. For better results than a plate capacitor, we can use this structure called a comb capacitor. This is the same idea as a large-scale real-life variable capacitor, like this one that comes out of a vintage radio. One of many ways to make this, we can use another technique in our toolbox called deep reactive ion etching, which drills straight down into a material 
by etching away a little bit and then applying a mask on the wall so that I cannot etch outward any farther. This can result in some very high aspect ratio trenches, even though the walls can be a little bit wobbly. With a pair of cone capacitors, we can allow the plates to move in and out of each other, either laterally or transversely, and we can again measure the capacitance between the two to figure out how much our center mass has moved. Or we could just slap another piezo resistor on the spring and call it a day. Or you could just use this monstrosity that some godless engineer invented. Two more sensors down and only about a dozen more to go. Wait, this just in. It's from our editor. He says, I quit. Coward. Well, you're not the only one that can do cool green screen effects or totally awesome motion graphics. There, just as good as the rest of the video. I guess we'll have to continue at a later date. Hey, I never said any of this was easy. This isn't rocket science, this is difficult. I hope that you learned something today, or at least gained an appreciation for all the work that goes into the things you take for granted. I've been your host, now allow me to play you out. <laughs>